So the conversation we want to have as we codify creative geniuses mm -hmm. is you're known as Alec Monopoly, the yeah. artist. What would you correct about that? What would you add to that introduction? You know, um, I'm known as the street artist because I love graffiti. You know, that's what got me here. Um, that's my true passion is painting in the streets. You know, we were just walking down the alleyway and doing some graffiti. That's what really makes me happy, so. And so as you create this thing called graffiti, a street-based art, what would you say is the voice or the message behind the kind of art that you use? Because it's not just about the colors. There's characters and there yeah. seems to be themes. Tell me about it. Um, for me, the Monopoly guy is, uh, he's kind of um, a meta-narrative. In the beginning, it's, it has two different purposes. So in 2008, when the financial disaster first hit, I was playing Monopoly and I was watching the news and Bernie Madoff came on the news and he was being arrested. And, and I was like, wow, this is so ironic. So I just did a painting of him and then I went out in the streets and did a bunch of paintings of the Monopoly man in the streets. And that kind of just gained so much notoriety and was picked up by a lot of different newspapers and publications. And that kind of just fed, you know, the fire and I just kept painting more. And, and But now it's kind of transformed into um, something that's like a symbol of my life, what's going on in my life, you know, a symbol of prosperity, wealth. And, uh, you know, a lot of my collectors keep the paintings as good luck charms and you know they have them in their offices and stuff like that so well it's interesting that bernie madoff you know uh, an incredible story mm -hmm. a man that was uh, the greatest ponzi scheme uh, architect that ever yeah. lived um but it's an interesting time because that was at the at the beginning of mm -hmm. uh, a very crucible moment for the entire planet which was the big financial fiasco yeah and so do you find that there is a story behind all of your art or is it what it was catalyzed by which was that one epic event? No, there always is a story behind it and another interesting fact is Monopoly, the game, came out in 1929 during the first you know, Great Depression. So that was one of the other reasons I kind of ran with it. And, um, you know, I think there's great, um, for great art, there needs to be dimensions in it. You know, there's, okay, once you look at it, it's a beautiful picture with beautiful colors. Then you look at it again, and then there's the Monopoly guy. What's the meaning behind that? And then you can even get closer and you can see, you know, what are these graffiti tags in the background? So that's kind of my roots of graffiti. You know, there's bubble letters up there of my name, and there's different tags. So I like to have a lot of different dimensions in my work. Well, you know, as we had a conversation before we went on camera, just about the fact that uh, you have young generations, call them millennials, mm -hmm. you have a, an older generation, like a Generation X, uh, and even older, and they're appreciating what this art represents and what it actually, in fact, says about mm -hmm. the society we came out from, the type of art and expressions that we once saw, the tags and the graffiti synonymous with the likes of break dancing and hip hop mm -hmm. and rap music, which today is very common. So have you found that this art, your expression um, and its story resonates across various age groups? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's crazy. The, I really see where my work sits is with the collectors. You know, I've sold work to old Wall Street guys that are, you know, are very old and CEOs of their companies. And then I've sold even to a 12 year old kid named Alec came to one of my art shows and, you know, he came from a very wealthy family in Texas and he bought three paintings. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very vast. You know, my work appeals to the masses. Right. Well, and with, and with that appeal and given the fact that it's got a broad base of, of, of attractability, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen you in the Middle East and of course in Asia, uh, all over the world, and I'm sure uh, dozens of countries, if not most yeah. of the countries on the planet, and you're just getting started. But you're more than just an artist. I know that you have a very creative eye, and the world of the corporate earth mm -hmm. has caught wind of this. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the corporate relationships you're beginning to build and expand into. Yeah, so, um, I mean, if you've seen my social media before, I'm a big fan of watches, and I'm always posting pictures of my watches. So I always knew in my the back of my head one day I would design a watch or I'd do something with a watch company, and recently I was approached by Tag Heuer, and they uh, just appointed me to be their art provocator. So it's basically a position where I'm going to be a art director, where I'm going to be creating work for the brand, I'm going to be tr transforming their boutiques into art galleries, and I'm also going to be a brand ambassador. So I'll be, for me as a graffiti artist, this was very appealing because Tag Heuer, you know, signage and billboards are everywhere. And this is kind of a way for me to express myself and do graffiti with their, you know, billboard campaigns and stuff like that. 
Well, what's interesting about that is you don't have to look too far back to recognize the biggest spokesperson for tag in their lines of watches was actually Tiger Woods. Yeah. And when you look at that athlete and his fall from grace and for a story that we can actually say for another time, that was the old way, the old narrative of connecting with a buying market. Yeah. Right, top performing athlete, you know, uh, birdies and pars and of course championships and the like. But now you've got Alec Monopoly, someone yeah. who's telling a very different story and who's actually sharing a narrative that's actually resonating across a number of demographics. Yeah. Old Wall Street brokers right down to young boys named Alec. Tell me, when you look out 20 years from now, maybe even 10 years from now, even five years from now, where else will you see your artistic influence shaping and or in fact being curated in? Will it be across things like real estate, uh, uh, furniture, um, and even other places of enterprise? Yeah, for me, I mean, I'm ever expanding with my work and then I think it's very important to be an artist as as you're growing. You know, you always have to be changing and growing and developing your style. So um, there's a lot of things that I want to explore. I mean, I love furniture design. I've always been attracted to furniture design. And in my studio, I've made like weird lamps. And, you know, I, I don't know why. It's just like I love furniture. So that's something I want to explore. I'm also uh, very attracted to doing more museum shows. I want to focus on more museums and public art installations, you know, big sculptures and stuff like that. Um, as you see with this piece, this is a, a Keith Haring painting and I really enjoy his work because he was a street artist from New York just painting the streets but he really transformed into this amazing artist this enigma with, that was doing public art installations huge sculptures in the squares of populated areas and you know he went from the streets to the galleries to the museums and that's kind of a, a role model for me and so given that it's a role model for you, and you've said this before, and I, I've referred to it as uh, the institutionalization mm -hmm. of, of you and your work, your yeah. inspired, creative life force. Um, what's the most important part about you and having these pieces, your work in a museum? Um, I think it kind of immortalizes yourself. You know, when I started out, I was just doing graffiti. You know, I was just painting in the streets. And then I came to this realization that um, graffiti is an epiphoral thing. You know, one day the building will be broken down. One day the, the wall will be painted over. So creating canvas is something special that will last forever. And I think, you know, being in the museum really immortalizes yourself. And to, you know, this day and age, you can be alive and be uh, one of these artists in the museums. And it, I had my first museum show in Thailand at the Museum of Contemporary Art. And that was just like, it was my lifelong goal to be in a museum. So I really want to continue that feeling. Well, it's, it's, I think it's not just a feeling. I think it's, uh, it sounds like one of your many destinations. Mm -hmm. So if you had a checklist of all the things that would actually allow you to be the best Alec you can be, mm -hmm. one of them sounds like the institutionalization yeah. of your work. But then when you look at the globalization of your work, where you get to have it be felt and experienced across very mm -hmm. many genres, um, it sounds like furniture design. It sounds like being able to be a creative director of other really great developments on the world. Yeah. Um, have you ever found a moment in time, and it may have just happened recently, where you saw your work, whether it was covered and or revealed somewhere, they went, wow, now that's cool. That's my piece, look at the coverage mm -hmm. you got, or look at all of the wonderful eyeballs that have now been on it. Have you had one of those moments? Yeah, I mean, for me, going back to Keith Haring, um, this really resonated for me. Was I was in art history class, and I saw a picture of Keith Haring, and he was in Times Square, and his his piece, you know, the baby crutch right. was up on the teleprompter and he was in Times Square and I was like, wow, that's so cool. He's larger than life. His art is in Times Square. So I had a collaboration with Forever 21 where they have a huge billboard in Times Square where um, I did the collaboration and my art was running on the billboard for a month straight. Wow. So Keith Haring's piece was just up for a couple minutes. Mine was up for a month straight of, you know, just, you know, constantly flowing through. It was amazing. That's amazing. It was a dream come true sitting there in Times Square because I'm from New York as well. And so it's a big deal for you. Yeah. At a very visceral level. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. And, you, and, and by the way, Times Square is, uh, is, is, is a regular launch pad for you. Mm -hmm. You just recently broke into the sculpturing world as yeah. well. 
Tell us about that experience. Um, you know, for me, uh, Jeff Koons is a huge, you know, inspiration for me. He makes these sculptures that are, you know, chrome, larger than life. They're selling for millions of dollars. So, you know, he's a role model for me as well. And um, I've taken my sculpture to the next level from just making little putty designs to making these huge, you know, electrochrome plated sculptures that with my characters, you know, similar style to his with the with the golds and the chromes and the and the shiny and the intangibleness of like the beauty, but at the same time I'm creating them with the Richie Riches or the Monopolies. So, you know, my underlining characters are there. Now, this might be a very self-serving uh, question, but but I grew up watching Richie Rich. Mm -hmm. And my name is Richard, so I got Richie Rich, although not blonde nor was I rich. <laughs> in order to have a dog named Dollar. Um, but what was it for you? I, I understand the story behind you know, Mr. Monopoly himself, but how did you come to uh, uh, harness and leverage and it would appear to artistically exploit the likes of Richie Rich? Where did that come up for you? Well, Richie, I'm a huge fan of Richie Rich as well, and Monopoly, so it came naturally to me. Got it. But you know, my underlining uh, meanings of money and wealth and prosperity kind of continued through Richie Rich and Scrooge McDuck and these characters that kind of continue the storyline of my work. I think it's important to, to stay true to yourself and, and what you're trying to express. Don't get lost in all this other stuff. And uh, yeah. Well, that's interesting coming from you as we, we wind down the conversation. Um, but you talk about wealth, you talk about prosperity. You're not someone who's a, a struggling artist. You're a yeah. highly celebrated uh, commercial success mm -hmm. and just getting started. Yeah. Um, when you talk about wealth and prosperity, what does it mean to you to be wealthy, to be uh, prosperous, to be rich in the things that matter? What's the first lines of definition that come up for you? Well, for me, it's become, you know, I love graffiti and I love painting in the streets and doing gallery shows and selling my canvas was kind of a vehicle to travel more and get out and reach more places like coming here to Toronto and even meeting you and going to paint in the back alleyway. That's that's my my happy place is painting in the streets. So basically to to continue doing that, I had to have success with selling artwork and and so in the beginning it was all about, you know, just traveling and painting more in the streets and then, you know, as I started to sell more, it's it was became more about developing new pieces like for instance those sculptures I make they can cost up to 50 grand in production to make those massive sculptures so it's you know I'm reinvesting all the money into you know developing new stuff and creating new works well, you know, that's exciting because, you know, your canvas really has been uh, billboards and door uh, walkways and yeah. door gated and door bricked alleyways. Now you're talking about manufacturing your very own canvas of yeah. sorts out of clay and door precious metals. And so that's also very, very uh, celebratory. But as you talk about that and you talk about the wealth, I think that's what ends up happening about your art. When you when you glorify what it means and if it brings prosperity and good luck, what you're saying is, is to not just idolize it but be inspired by the art. Yeah don't just worship it like the Madoffs of the world because look what happens then, is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. It's, um, you know, it's a symbol of prosperity and it's motivation as well. You see the Monopoly guy running with a bag of money or here, you know, w with Richie Rich getting on a private jet. It's kind of motivation. You look at that every day and you're like, hey, I want to save every dollar and invest it and do this stuff and create wealth. Well, good. Well, I've got five last questions that are coming rapid fire because uh, they're quick and they're short and they're important for us to know. Uh, question number one. When you're at your best and doing what you love, are you able to keep track of time or you lose sense of time? No, I completely lose sense of time. I mean, I'm not paying attention. I'm Half the time when I'm up on a wall doing graffiti, I forget to even go to the bathroom or even eat. I'll be up there for a whole day painting and I don't even know what's going on. I come down, I'm like, man, I gotta piss, I'm hungry, what's going on? It's like, I'm in the zone. So. Got it, got it. So when you're in the zone, question number two is when you're in the zone, um, are you having a very focused, uh, attempt on getting what you're doing done or are there any other disturbances that are able to come into your peripheral? I kind of try to eliminate all those disturbances and I call it laser focus where I'm just like laser focused with the spray can I'm in one and I'm like on the wall and I, I usually have you know a bodyguard or someone with me making sure no one even comes near me because I don't even want to hear anyone else. Got it. Number three, has there ever been a time when you have been not able to paint like you could or create like you would and it starts to drive you nuts or are you able to exist in your skin without painting? Um, yeah, for me, I was going out a lot. I was partying with friends. I was drinking and I was waking up hungover. And that would really en enable me from getting up and actually doing what I'm doing. So I haven't been drinking for the past two months and I've just felt my brain is so much more clear and I'm so much more focused. And you can even see in my work where everything is, is there's more attention to detail. 
So last two questions, and they're most the most powerful, and they're the deepest. I'll say them. Slowly. Okay. As you're here, living and breathing, what do you love hearing people say about your work? You know, for me, it's it's not even about what they say. I love seeing the facial expressions they have. And when I do gallery shows, and I see, I, I don't really like to it, like my favorite picture is the picture of the people standing here looking at the piece, not them seeing the piece, and their smiles and their reactions and their and their emotions of happiness. That's what I'm trying to draw from people is happiness, and you know, have them revisit happy moments of childhood, playing Monopoly with their family. 100%. Or, yeah, one hundred percent. I just I, I get that at a visceral level because I walked in with my good friend Zark. Um, who arranged for us to meet and I saw a painting here which is actually right there and it's one of my favorite pieces it has mm -hmm. two of my favorites so I didn't know it evoked that emotion yeah. so I get that I know that you were reading that last and final one is that uh, and this is hopefully for another hundred years so hopefully you're here for another hundred years so a hundred years from now you're you pass on what do you want the world saying about you um, for for me, I mean, going to art school and learning about Andy Warhol and Basquiat and Van Gogh and these these monumental artists that you know, when when I've been painting before, people are like, "Oh, you're the next Warhol," or "You're the next Basquiat." And I'm like, thinking in my head, I'm like, "No, I'm Alec," and I want you know the next generation of kids. Some people saying, "Oh, you're the next Alec," you know, that would be pretty That'd amazing. Be cool. So to be able to know that you can look down or look up or mm. wherever you end up. Uh, whatever perspective you might have to be able to see the world being inspired by generating a new generation yeah. of artists inspired by your work. Kind of similar to this painting in Keith Haring, you know. Absolutely. Maybe they're going to be doing pieces that are similar to mine in the next piece. Well done. Alec? Thanks, man. Oh, man. I appreciate you. Thank you very Thank much. You.